Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's Global Macro Currents Tracking Market Volatility Compression Webinar, which will be presented by Dr. Lev Bordovsky, Bordovsky Chief Risk Officer here at Star Mountain Capital and also the editor of the Wall Street Journal's Daily Shot. I'm John Polis, and I will be your moderator today. I am the Chief Operating Officer for your webinar host, Star Mountain Capital, a specialized asset management firm focused on investing in the large and underserved U.S. lower middle market of companies with typically under 15 million of EBITDA. Before I hand over the reins to Lev, I did want to let you know that your audio is muted and will be for the entirety of the presentation. Also, as a disclaimer, I wanted to note that nothing presented in this webinar or in the webinar materials uh, constitute an offer to sell or a solicitation of an offer to purchase Y Star Mountain Capital interest in any investment product. We have allocated time at the end of the presentation for Q&A. If you have a question, you can type it into the Q&A chat box of your WebEx client. We will try to get to as many questions as possible before the hour is up. Now a little bit about our presenter. Uh, Lev Borodovsky has over 20 years of experience covering private equity, equity risk management and operations. He was a founding team member, chief risk officer, and managing director of the GSO Blackstone platform, one of the most successful global credit and loan investment platforms. Currently, Lev is the chief risk officer here at Star Mountain Capital and also the editor of The Daily Shot, a chart-based newsletter covering select global economic and market, and market trends that is now part of the Wall Street Journal. Lev, we are excited to have you with us for part two of our webinar series today. Thanks, John. Really appreciate it. Uh, uh, great to uh, get everybody on the call. Uh, this is uh, a topic that's especially interesting for me um, and uh, has uh, been developing quite rapidly. Um, it's, uh, it's about tracking uh, market volatility compression that we've all experienced. Uh, so let's go ahead and, and get going. Um, <clears throat> here's what I'd like to cover today. Uh, first, um, let's you know take a look at the volatility trends. When people talk about volatility compression, uh, falling volatility, what do they mean? Um, and we'll look at it for the U.S. equity market in particular, but also for other asset classes. Um, and then uh, a more interesting uh, dynamic is what are some of the uh, economic reasons behind this volatility compression? And there's uh, quite a bit of debate out there about you know what exactly is causing this. Um, you know, one of the reasons some suggest that volatility is compressed, and, and this is this is uh, also is hotly debated, is that there's a lot of volatility shorting out there, um, and uh, you know it's become a, a hot uh, investment uh, strategy. How's it done? Why now? And then we'll take a look at uh, what could uh, end this, uh, or, or at least interrupt this. Um, volatility gravy train that we're, you know, a lot of people making a lot of money. All right, so let's proceed. Uh, so let's look at, let's start with the, you know, stock market volatility in the United States. Uh, if you just look at, uh, take a 30-day standard deviation of, you know, uh, the S&P 500 and look at that over time. Um, we are, are at the lows. Um, this, this data goes back 10 years right here, uh, but I think if you take it further, you will still see that we're, we're at the lows. Uh, you know, uh, the, the movements, uh, especially to the downside, have been uh, extremely limited. <clears throat> and <clears throat> another way to look, to look at uh, kind of the market movement is to look at the range, the you know, daily trading range. And, and here is the percent daily trading range, 20-day moving average, um, and that is also at the lows. Um, here's here's a, a way to look at um, basically all you do is um, take the up and down 1% moves uh, in the S&P 500 and count those. 
you know, how how many times do you have one percent up or down in the S&P 500? And uh, again, we're at the lows. Uh, I find this chart particularly interesting because this one says. How many days have we had where the S&P 500 declined by 2% in a day? And you can see that frequency declining over time, and we basically haven't had any um, in, in this year uh, or in, in sort of recent uh, history. Uh, so it's, um, it's quite incredible what's going on. Of course, as uh, historical realized volatility declines, so does the implied volatility. Um, you know, this is the volatility, this is the premium charged in um, stock options, uh, in particular index options. And if you look at the three month options, uh, so at the money implied volatility, uh, that is also hitting uh, new lows. Um, and you can plot this using one month implied volatility or um, you know similar type of measures. And what you'll find is that um, we're at a near, hovering near the, the lows. Uh, similarly, uh, you know the the volatility index uh, called VIX is also um, hovering you know quite close to the lows. It's it's been uh, below 10 for several days and, and uh, uh, will, you know, has, has been um, hitting uh, record lows in, in sort of recent months. One uh, interesting component of this uh, trend is that as the index volatility uh, got compressed, the individual volatility of individual stocks hasn't declined as fast. Uh, investors perceive there to be more volatility, more risk in individual stocks than in, in the index, um, and the, the, two, the two kind of diverged, which resulted in um, the decline in implied correlation. Basically, the market thinks that um, there's the correlation among stocks in the S&P 500 uh, is has declined. Uh, what does that mean? Well, it just it suggests that there there's uh, there's again a disconnect, a little bit of disconnect between the index uh, and and where the the volatility of the index is is, uh, is showing up, the risk of the index and the, and the individual stocks, but also points to potentially different sectors moving in different directions, uh, presumably in part due to um, uh, some divergence of, of sector performance. Um, it's, a, it's an interesting opportunity because some view this as a, a, a stock picker's market because it, when correlation is low, um, stock selection becomes uh, uh, more uh, valuable. But it's, it's an interesting trend that, that I, I continue to track. But of course, uh, volatility compression is not limited to stocks. And let's take a look at a couple of things uh, in, in uh, a couple of trends in other asset classes. So in rates, um, the multiple ways to look at a volatility, but one, one common way people do this is they look at uh, volatility of swaptions. Uh, these are um, this is the option, the, the right to enter into an interest rate swap. And this particular one is the right to enter into a 10-year rate swap three months from now. Um, and uh, that the volatility of that option is near the lows. Uh, so uh, interest rate compression um, is uh, – interest rate volatility compression is also taking place. Note that uh, if you look at kind of late 2016, there was a jump in this uh, rate volatility and that, that was due to the, the outcome of the elections. People thought there's um, 
there's going to be um, this trend of reflation where uh, we will we'll have uh, much higher growth, higher inflation, and uh, rates could potentially uh, rise dramatically. Uh, that hasn't happened. Uh, growth has been okay. Uh, rates have not risen dramatically. Inflation has been subdued. And, and so um, interest rate volatility declined to the levels below the pre-election levels, um, which is uh, uh, quite incredible, actually, that, that we're seeing this, this uh, compression. This is telling you that the market doesn't believe that there's a great chance that you know, 10-year Treasury yields will rise dramatically. Um, in fact, it sees them as staying subdued. In credit, um, there's uh, another instrument. Uh, this is also a swaption, uh, on, uh, the right to enter into a different type of swap, uh, CDX, uh, which is a, an index of credit default swaps. Uh, and, and this one gives you the right to enter into a, uh, a CDX, which is a five-year product, uh, six months out, right? So what's the volatility on that? And uh, this chart from J.P. Morgan also shows that we're at record lows. Um, you know, even compared to uh, the um, bubble years of, of 2006, we're still below that in, in credit uh, volatility. Um, so this, this is basically saying that the market views credit spreads um, as expressed through uh, credit default swap spreads, uh, basically uh, staying, uh, um, you know, pr not moving much. And, and this this is quite unusual, and and it's also interesting that um, we have this this ongoing trend. Now, obviously, these are all linked uh, rates and credit and and, and stocks. Uh, but it, it's really surprising to see this, this level of compression in, in credit. Um, you know, looking at commodities, you know, gold uh, volatility, uh, and this one is um, an index of uh, exchange-traded funds that uh, focus on gold. Uh, and uh, the CBOE created a, a VIX equivalent um, for these types of ETFs. So gold uh, implied volatility rose a bit uh, late in the summer um, when we had a, a bunch of sort of geopolitical issues, um, including North Korea. Um, but it's back, you know, it's back to, you know, near, near the lows again. Um, so it's, uh, it's also quite unusual. Here's uh, the volatility uh, index for oil, also using oil uh, ETFs. Um, and uh, that's compressing. Here, uh, obviously, there, there are sort of uh, commodity-specific issues, which is that um, people view OPEC and Russia as, as having some control uh, to the to protect uh, the downside in crude oil um, and not not allow another sort of uh, 2015 2016 sort of correction uh, that we've had um, and given that there's you know this downside protection uh, built in because of of the the way the way you know OPEC operates. Uh, volatility is compressing there as well. Um, and, you know, each individual one of these could be a, kind of a, a sort of its own story, but the fact that they're all trending lower is, is, is really uh, quite unusual. Emerging markets, um, so if you look at um, an ETF called uh, EEM, which is the largest um, 
emerging markets um, stock stock market ETF um, and look at the implied volatility, uh, three month at the money implied volatility, uh, we're um, also um, hitting new lows. Uh, so emerging markets, you would think, um, should be divergent from from developed markets, but but the volatility is not. It's it's also compressing. One of the aspects that people are struggling with is um, there's this concept of economic policy uncertainty. Uh, these indices have been around for quite a while, and what they do is they look at news flow um, and track um, news content that may indicate you know, some sort of um, uncertainty or, or um, concern or risk um, in economic policy. And those indices, um, they're lower, but they're, um, they certainly have not hit the, the, you know, the absolute level, low levels. And if you look at uh, this comparison, it, it has this uh, MOVE index, M-O-V-E, which is a, an interest rate um, volatility index, as well as VIX, which is a, a stock market volatility index. And both of those have diverged from economic policy uncertainty. So, so what this is saying is that despite um, some uncertainties around policy and, and geopolitical uh, risks, um, you know, volatility uh, measures in the markets uh, have declined, uh, which is, again, uh, very puzzling. So uh, people debate why this is happening and what, what are the causes of, of these trends. Um, and uh, here are some possibilities. So uh, the most common is just simply that uh, you know, the global economy is is healing and recovering uh, quite well, uh, and most importantly, that it is uh, synchronized, meaning that um, the economic growth is um, is positive and improving around the world, uh, f uh, both in in emerging and developed markets. Uh, here's uh, uh, a com simple comparison of um, the uh, U.S., Eurozone, and, and Japan's uh, uh, GDP uh, growth. So one of the things people look at, uh, one of the items that, that could cause volatility uh, it would be uh, negative economic surprises. So if you expect uh, you know, unemployment rate to stay constant or or maybe decline some and the employment rate jumps, uh, that could cause a spike in volatility. Uh, similarly to inflation or um, or GDP growth or other types of economic data. And so the, the Citigroup index uh, measures economic surprises, positive and negative. Um, and it says that this year we've had uh, a lot more positive economic surprises than negative uh, by a long shot, uh, something we haven't seen in years. And those positive economic surprises uh, where, you know, economists have a forecast but the actual data is better tend to um, suppress volatility because there's less risk premium required. People are less worried about uh, market corrections and spreads widening and so uh, and so on. Um, and uh, so here's the um, the comparisons. It's really quite striking. And in fact, if you look at the variability of GDP growth, um, it's the lowest in at least 50 years, at least as far as this data goes back. And what does this do? This, this basically takes a, um, uh, I think it's 45 countries, 
and looks at their GDP growth and says, you know, if you plot the distribution of those 45 countries, their GDP growth, how wide is this distribution? And um, it's that that distribution is actually pretty tight. It's the tightest it's, it's ever been. Uh, so, um, you know, these 45 major countries are all growing and are growing at a, not at the same rate, but certainly closer than ever before, right? So you don't have, you know, China growing at 12% and uh, the Eurozone um, having a negative GDP growth, which is what we had, you know, in previous years, um, you don't have that anymore. Um, you know, China is growing at 6%, the Eurozone is growing at 2%, the U.S. is growing at 2%, uh, but that variability has declined dramatically. And so people think that because of that, uh, volatility has also been, been suppressed. A more important uh, contribution, I think, to why volatility has, has declined so much is the, the decline in the volatility of the GDP itself over time. So again, if you look at those 45 countries, but rather than looking across the different countries, you, you, you average them out, uh, weight, weighted average, and then you, you look at the standard deviation of the GDP volatility. How much does, G, does GDP change from year to year? And GDP volatility has declined sharply. Uh, so you, you don't have the kind of variability that you had, again, fairly recently when, you know, let's say in, in uh, uh, you know, 2009 or 2008, where you had some countries going to deep recession and other countries of the prospering. And, uh, um, and so you, you have, or the volatility of the GDP where one year you have, you know, global GDP growing at 4% and next year it's down a, a percent or something like that. Uh, that's not happening anymore. Uh, you, you know, if you look at the IMF uh, measures, they basically tweak the GDP forecasts you know, half a percent here, half a percent there, but the volatility itself isn't uh, isn't changing as much. And so this is probably an even more important contributor to uh, why, you know, market volatility is, is also uh, depressed. If you think about, um, you know, what causes market volatility, um, you know, ultimately it's, it's things like earnings, uh, it's things like inflation, uh, which, are, which are driven by things like GDP growth and demand and so on. If those variables are re reasonably constant, then supposedly it, it will depress, um, you know, volatility as well. But I think this is the most striking sort of chart demonstrating why um, market volatility has, has been suppressed. A third reason uh, that people have mentioned is uh, central banks have become a lot more transparent in that central banks are um, communicating a lot more. Uh, they're, they're more open about their policy decisions and, um, and that's um, giving, giving the market, the transparency is giving the markets comfort that there won't be any surprises from the central banks along the way, or no significant surprises from the central banks. Um, and so the markets then shift from uh, the central banks, they're less worried about central banks, they shift on, them on, on economic data. And as we've seen uh, in, in the previous chart, economic data is, is pretty, it has become pretty low volatility type, type time series, um, and, and so if central banks are not a concern and the uh, economic data volatility is low, that feeds into, you know, lower market volatility. You know, what, 
what can central banks possibly do to surprise the market? Well, if they're if central banks are data driven, not a whole lot. Um, and this chart basically shows that <laughs> the number of speeches that uh, central bankers, um, you know, major central bankers have been giving is on the rise. And so, you know, central bank officials from, you know, the Fed to the ECB to the BOJ uh, are out there uh, talking about the policy, uh, their views on the, on the policy, you know, why they, they want to do certain things. Um, and in many cases, they're reasonably synchronized in their, in their uh, views. There are obviously differences, but not dramatic. And and so people have gotten comfortable that the central banks are not going to surprise them. And that's that's what this is showing. So so these are some of the reasons behind potentially volatility compressions. Um, so volatility shorting uh, it's become a, a big trend. Um, Everybody is getting in on it, um, and. Uh, it's uh, it's been very lucrative for for a, a, a lot of investors. Um, why, why now? Why you know why all of a sudden everybody's shorting volatility, uh, especially given the, how compressed it is. Um, and uh, so there's a in, so the last um, I don't know decade plus. Um, VIX futures, the VIX futures contract has become um, a very popular instrument. Um, and the reason is that you can take a pure view on volatility. Before VIX futures uh, was out there, uh, if you want to take a bet on, on volatility going up or down, uh, you have to buy or sell options in whatever instrument that, that you're, you're uh, whatever sector that, or um, uh, asset class that you're interested in. And when you, when you buy or sell an option, you have, um, you have to take into account the options maturity. You have to take into account um, the fact that, you know, you have to, you don't just have volatility exposure, you have underlying market exposures. You have delta risk, you have to hedge. Uh, you have gamma risk, where even if you've hedged your delta risk, um, you know, market moves, and now you have to re-hedge your delta risk. Um, and so it, it was very difficult to take a pure uh, volatility bet. Um, there were banks that would offer uh, variance swaps and things of that nature that uh, kind of provided you with a form of direct volatility uh, bet. But it was uh, these were expensive um, and um, uh, very liquid, and uh, your uh, smaller investors or, or retail investors could not participate in them. VIX changed all that. If you have a futures account, you basically go out there and you short a. Uh, if you want a short volatility, you can short a, a VIX futures contract, say you know two three months out. And if volatility does not change at all, um, you just sit on that position, um, the, the, the VIX contract will just roll down the curve and you'll make money. Uh, it's that simple. Of course, you know, the risk is that the, this uh, typically uh, positively sloping VIX futures curve is not always this way. And if there is a, uh, uh, some sort of a, a volatility jump, this futures curve uh, becomes negatively sloping, um, uh, goes from what's called contango to backwardation, and so you could you could lose a lot of money and get a big margin call. But if if there's no big moves in volatility, even if volatility increases a little bit, uh, and but the curve still stays uh, positively sloping, just by rolling down the futures contract. Um, you can make money. And once people figure that out, uh, that, that became a pretty uh, trendy thing to do. You, you know, open your futures account and go and short this. But the real um, explosion in the, uh, in, 
this trend of shorting volatility came about, I think, also about a little less than a decade ago, um, when various uh, exchange-traded funds, exchange-traded notes were introduced uh, that do the, you know, they basically do the um, roll down the curve for you. You don't have to open the futures account. You don't have to do anything. You just basically go out there, find one of these exchange-traded notes, and short it. And you can do that in your trade, uh, e-trade account, right? Uh, and, and and so that opened it up to retail uh, folks who are, um, are not interested in having a futures account or you know maintaining margin, worrying about margin calls. They just basically go out there in their E-Trade account and short. Uh, for example, this um, ETF or ETN that is expected to track uh, double the the VIX uh, movements, right? And so if you shorted this particular position, it went, as you can see, went in a year from being as high as 200 to being uh, less than 10. Um, and so if you shorted this, uh, it's, uh, it's a, obviously a very lucrative position. But then some, some retail investors like, oh, I, I don't want to be shorting stuff. My, my account doesn't allow me to short anything. Um, and so, of course, a product was created for them as well. Uh, so this product, uh, which is, uh, there's several of them now, but this particular one is um, a ticker symbol XIV, which is the inverse of VIX, um, is shorts the VIX futures for you. So you don't have to short anything. You buy this, and it, it will the the fund will go out there and put a put a short uh, VIX futures position on your behalf, effectively, and and roll down down the curve. And again, as you can see, this thing went from being you know from I don't know 40 a year ago to um, I think it's 110 today. Um, and uh, so very, very lucrative type of contract. And people say, well, what happens if there is a disruption in the volatility spike? And you can see an example here. Um, you had the North Korean nuclear test uh, and, and some, some scary uh, U.S.-North Korea exchanges back and forth, um, you know, in the summer. And yes, this thing corrected pretty sharply, it went from kind of high 90s to uh, low 70s in a matter of days, all right? So big correction. But if you hung in there, um, you know, volatility came down. And just by sheer rolling down that curve, you've made up uh, and more uh, the losses during that period. And so as these events happen, uh, people increasingly become uh, very comfortable with, uh, you know, uh, in buying this thing and just holding on to it. Um, and for folks who haven't done this for, for, for many years, you know, it's a new thing. They, they, they think they, they found a gold mine. So what could possibly go wrong? Uh, you know, it's a gravy train, right? So just as an example, if you look at this uh, XIV um, ETN uh, that, that we saw here, right? If just take this, this product and look at it in 2015, um, there was a, a couple of days in August when uh, after China devalued its currency. It wasn't a major devaluation, but it was a devaluation nonetheless, and people were anticipating something like that to happen. Uh, it was, you know, people thought it was fairly deflationary in nature if that was going to happen. Um, and, uh, you know, nobody knew how deep the devaluation will, will, will go, how far China was going to devalue the currency. 
Um, and when that happened, uh, this thing went from being, you know, just below 50 to uh, under 25 in a couple of days, basically. Um, so you lost over over half your value in a couple of days, very quickly, right? Um, and, you know, again, if you hung in there for the next couple of years, you more than made up uh, that loss. But uh, if you need that money quickly, it's, uh, you know, pretty scary uh, correction. Um, and, of course, people who are shorting the, the uh, 2X product, um, you know, you would lose double this amount, right? Um, there's, there's, I spoke to a, uh, an expert on this particular product, the XIV product. He basically said, if you have a, a huge correction um, in, in your know, spike in volatility, uh, you could get into a situation where XIV, this ETN product, hits zero. Uh, basically goes from wherever it is to zero, right? It's possible. And the if you read the fine print in, in this product, when it does hit zero, it won't recover from that. They basically close that account. Uh, so it is entirely possible that you could basically lose all your money, and even if volatility uh, does, you know, decline from there, you take, you know, you basically lose the whole thing. Uh, it's a, it's a, it would be a rare event, uh, but uh, something like a um, North Korea, um, you know, uh, shooting war could potentially do that. And, and that's, you know, obviously people can lose a shirt doing it. So we talked about these VIX futures contracts. And if you look at um, the uh, balances at longs and shorts uh, in the in these uh, VIX futures contract contracts, you'll see that there's it's split up. The uh, CFTC splits it up into sort of commercial accounts, people who are, who are hedging or, or doing some other activity, and speculative accounts, or what they call non-commercial. Speculative accounts would be you know, hedge funds and, and um, other types of speculative players. Um, and it shows that the speculative players, the non-commercial players, have accumulated a uh, record net short in VIX futures. Um, and so, so what? People say, so what? Who cares, right? So they have a massive net short position. Somebody has a massive net long position because for every short, there's a long. But the, the issue here is that people who are short volatility are a lot less patient than people who are long volatility. Because if, if, you, buy, if you buy a um, volatility product, you buy options or something like that, you, you're, you're probably putting some protection in your portfolio. You're willing to um, take a, a gradual loss uh, to protect your portfolio. Whereas people who are, do, who are shorting volatility are uh, sitting on the edge worried about, you know, volatility spike and hoping that nothing will happen and they can make their money. If volatility starts rising, they will quickly unwind their, try to unwind their position. So the unwind of this will be highly asymmetrical where uh, people who are covering their shorts will be much more eager and willing to do that than people who are um, – uh, you know, unwinding their longs, and and so you will you will potentially uh, move the volatility um, indices uh, sharply higher, and uh, the losses in the space could be tremendous. Um, some have suggested that this is sort of the the new bubble, similarly to uh, the way the housing market became a bubble back in. Um, you know, 2006. And just to uh, finish off here, um, I received this email, um, and it was uh, it was just a, one of those marketing, e you know, uh, spam emails. 
that seems to be going across to um, you know broad audience, mostly retail. And here's what it said: the secrets to the hottest trade, shorting VIX, right? Uh, when you see that, this tells you that there, there's a, a potential problem in this market. When, when it's it's you know there's spam emails going out and talking about a, the hottest trade, you know that you know that this is uh, this potentially could not end well. Um, and so that that's definitely a concern when when you see these types of things happening. When your cab driver starts talking about shorting volatility, you know there's there's an issue. So uh, with that, I just want to conclude and and see if we have uh, questions. Um, it's it's a, an amazing sort of development and an interesting topic, and I'd love to talk more about it. Great, Lev. Well, thanks thanks very much. Um, you know, one of the things that, that, that came up during the course of, uh, of your presentation uh, is the, you know, the record, you know, the record period of low volatility. How, how much, if at all, does the rollback of a lot of the regulation in U.S., you know, in, in U.S. Congress play into that? Yeah, uh, I've heard discussions about this. Um, you know the the regulatory activity um, has uh, has increased obviously since the since the financial crisis and uh, volatility was declining. Uh, now you know obviously the talk of uh, sort of rolling back some of this um, has helped reduce volatility just because. Uh, people are less concerned about um, banks being slammed with uh, regulatory action um, and and see more uh, opportunity for market appreciation which tends to be helpful for to reduce volatility but most people don't think it's a major aspect of the roll down in 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 uh, volatility you know in, in the volatility compression Sure. How, are, are there any other reasons for for this low volatility? Yeah. So another um, proposal I've heard was the fact that inflation has been extremely low, uh, and low inflation means that uh, people are less concerned about uh, you know a spike in in interest rates, which could could impact everything from you know obviously rate volatility to uh, the stock market. I mean, people often forget that the, the reason uh, people justify the current stock market valuation valuations has to do with low interest rates, right? Uh, if, you, if you just take uh, future earnings and discount them at a very low rate, you get a much higher number. Um, and, and so uh, uh, in low inflation provides for not just low interest rates, but the lower risk of interest rates going higher, right? Would, 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 and that's, that's one of the reasons for compression. You talked uh, a few times about some significant geopolitical events that could you know, play a major disruption, uh, disruption with, with, with this low volatility uh, 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 Regime, what else could could disrupt it? Yeah, um, and I, I'd love to hear from from the audience uh, what they think could be a a major geopolitical event. Uh, you know, obviously North Korea stands out, and that you know, again, a shooting war with North Korea uh, will uh, send volatility indices to um, the levels we haven't seen probably since uh, 2008. Um, but you could also have things like um, a um, major credit event, let's say a, a, a high-profile U.S. company f unexpectedly, you know, files for bankruptcy. Um, it's, it's not happening so far because there's a lot of liquidity in the market uh, and uh, companies who need liquidity just tap it. They may get downgraded or get hurt. Um, but they they seem to be surviving. 
Uh, but you know, a trend like that, a credit event, could could be another another one. Uh, a jump in inflation is obviously a, a potential concern. Um, we're not seeing any any evidence of that so far, uh, but it could happen, right? Um, you know, all of a sudden inflation accelerates unexpectedly. Uh, that could do it. Uh, more aggressive. Um, Central bankers could, could you know, uh, all of a sudden uh, the uh, ECB says we're going to quickly unwind uh, the balance sheet. Uh, it could that kind of thing could do could create a problem, but they don't want to do that. Obviously, nobody believes they would do anything drastic like that, uh, so nobody's concerned. Um, and there are other sort of geopolitical. Issues uh, from you know anything from the Middle East to um, you know South China Sea that uh, could could cause a a, uh, a spike in volatility and, and again if if anybody in the audience has other uh, suggestions uh, you know please pop them up in the, in the in the chat box. How about a surprise pick as a new Fed chairman? Yeah, you know, uh, I, I've, I've talked about this in the Daily Shot a, a few times. Um, so, um, John Taylor, for example, was um, was was a bit of a concern because, uh, you know, if you if you listen to the guy, he, he basically sees the um, what's called the neutral rate of interest in the United States, so neutral interest rates, uh, as being uh, Quite a bit higher than what the current Fed thinking is, right? Currently, the the Fed thinks that um, you know the uh, the neutral rate is somewhere around you know it's under one percent, uh, and uh, you know John Taylor thinks it's higher, which means that you could create a more aggressive tightening cycle um, by the Fed, but you know the Fed is already doing presumably three three hikes a year, right? Maybe four, and the market is okay with that. They kind of anticipated this to happen. So a new central banker coming in and saying, "Well, you know, they're not going to they're not going to hike more frequently than three four times a year. That's just not going to happen." Uh, but they may say, "We're going to hike for longer." Um, but at this point. Yeah, you know, you will you will you will definitely increase bond yields a bit, uh, and may you know increase volatility. But but the market is just isn't con as concerned about that you know becoming a major disruption. You had a pretty good slide in there. Uh, I think it was in the middle of the presentation on how many um, speeches uh, given over the last X years, year by year, by Fed Board of Governors. And I thought that was interesting. How does you know, the central bank transparency help to compress volatility. Yeah, so so one example of that is the so-called dot plot, right? So if you look at the dot plot, um, it projects, it gives the, 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 the Fed's view, um, so the median view and, and the dispersion around that median view of where the central bank sees interest rates, where it sees inflation, uh, and GDP growth, right? And so by looking at that, the market immediately says, oh, we know exactly how the FOMC thinks. We know what they, what they view as the, you know, how they view the world. And that alone is, is a great sort of transparency tool uh, that uh, the market is Basing its its assumptions on. Now, a lot of times, the market says, "Well, they're probably, you know, too aggressive on rates. You know, they, the the market isn't as convinced that they're going to hike rates as much as the Fed is saying they will." Uh, but but again, the market is used to it. It's 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 a, it's a great tool for them to uh, adjust valuations. Uh, and given these come out every quarter, um, and uh, uh, you know, the, again, the market is, is, is comfortable with it. They see the small adjustments as they take place from quarter to quarter, um, and 
and and there's there's a lot of comfort built into this this whole process that there won't be any surprises and any surprises that that show up in the Fed's dot plot um, have already shown up in uh, economic data releases you know employment inflation GDP that type of thing um, and so they're, they're basically view the Fed as more formulaic in that sense in, in that they're, it's data dependent um, and and so they just to follow the dots uh, which makes it a, a much simpler, uh, less "quote unquote" risky um, view of the um, monetary policy, and that compresses volatility. Now, other other things that the, the Fed does, uh, and which is a, well, these are more recent events, uh, is, is these press conferences, right? So, Janet Yellen gives a press conference that lasts for a while. She talks a lot about what the FOMC is thinking and what their concerns are. Uh, communicates that pretty openly, and so people know exactly what they're put, what their um, kind of um, you know uh, risk points are. What what are they concerned about? Um, and that's what they watch, and 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 it's so they don't it reduces the surprise level. Uh, from from the central bank, and they, for anybody who, who listened to the um, press conference uh, by the ECB, those are also quite extensive, uh, very detailed, and um, um, you know reduces the um, the risk. Now, the Fed is 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 much more skillful at this at communicating than the ECB. So if you look at you know the once the Fed is ready to hike rates, they will send an army of the FOMC officials out there to give speeches that hint that this this is coming, right? I'm comfortable with another rate hike, blah blah blah, and and so uh, they they will prepare the market. So by the time the rate hike does happen or it doesn't happen, there's very little uh, uncertainty. You look at uh, right now, for example, the Futures market is pricing in about um, an 80% chance of a December hike, right? As we approach December, um, you know that number will go to if 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 the Fed is ready to hike, they'll not go to 90, all right? But it won't it won't swing between sort of 30 and and 90 quickly. It's 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 a gradual process where the Fed prepares you for what their policy is. And that gradual process uh, gives the market enough comfort to, to uh, cut that volatility. The ECB is, is, is a relatively new central bank. If you think about the, the creation of ECB, it came about since the euro. Um, and they're only recently learned about how to do this communication stuff. So once, <coughs> excuse me, once in a while, Drag it will go say something and market misinterprets it, and you have a, a big correction in the bond market. Uh, but they're learning, right? They're getting there, and so the uh, they their communication has is, is, is gotten a lot better as well. So I, I don't know if that kind of answers your question. Yeah. So so based on what you just said, it it seems as if the Fed is very uh, concerned about managing swings in volatility. And uh, and keeping you know keeping those swings rather compressed. Yeah, it's a, it's a it's a little bit of an irony, um, and that's why some people say that you know maybe too much transparency is not a good thing. Uh, it's a little bit of an irony because Janet Yellen uh, a couple of years ago, what, uh, I remember her coming out and saying volatility compression is um is scary for her it's scary for for the fed because it means that people are willing to take much higher risks uh you know if they're if not worried about volatility they, they will take higher risks which is a, a risk for the um financial system potentially and that's something the fed is is deeply concerned about right and she said, "Come on, guys! You know, this, the volatility is too low uh, across different markets. It, uh, at the same time, their own transparency 
is what's contributing to this low volatility. So, mm -hmm. so a little bit of a trap for them, right? Where they don't want the volatility to compress this, this much because it it uh, induces risk taking, right? If you're if you think the stock market isn't going to gap 10% tomorrow, uh, and there's no chance of that, and a lot of people don't believe there's any chance of that, um, then you're willing to um, you know, buy stocks on margin, you're willing to leverage. And the same thing with credit, you know, high yield, uh, and so on. When, when there's little volatility, people are more willing to take more risk, right? In fact, there are funds out there whose strategy is based on kind of market volatility. If the volatility compresses, they invest more in that particular asset class. And so, they, you know, they chase low volatility product um, and leverage. So, so that it created a, a bit of a problem for the Fed in that they don't want volatility compression. They're scared of it because it causes it creates a risk for the financial system. But at the same time, their communication is is contributing to lower volatility. And so, some people have suggested that maybe there is too much transparency, and that that it's uh, you know could be ultimately detrimental to the market. So that debate continues. Well, it's certainly better than the days of, uh, of everybody sitting around and, and waiting for the release of the minutes from the last uh, uh, Fed meeting, right? <laughs> yep, yep. And, and it could have been, you know, uh, that one the release could have caused a, you know, two percent move in the stock market. Right. And those days are over. It just doesn't happen. You know, there's surprises here and there where a few more people are concerned about inflation, or a few more people are concerned that. Uh, uh, inflation is too low, um, and and so that moves the markets on on the margin. But but it certainly doesn't do what it used to do, uh, because people are very comfortable that there won't be a lot of surprises from from the central banks. Yeah, yeah. Um, Lev, this was great as always. It looks like we're coming up on our hour, um, right on the nose. In, in fact, um, thanks again. We we appreciate it very much. I do want to thank everybody who uh, who's logged in and, and attended, and uh, and and again, thank, uh, thanks very much to Lev. Should anyone have any further questions or feedback, comments, et cetera, please feel free to email them to us at webinars at starmountaincapital.com. Lev, thanks very much. Thanks very much to everybody, and have a great rest of the day. Thanks, John. Take care. Bye-bye.